everyone. Hello, Slush. Hello, I Helsinki. I didn't hear that big hand. Hello, everyone. <laughs> All right. There he goes. We got Brazil and Brooklyn in the house. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I told you you had to come here. This place is Amazing. Um, fucking believable, right? When, when you described it <laughs> last year, I thought you were exaggerating, and then no. I arrived and I, I realized that you were actually underselling it. No, shit is real here. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Mind blowing. And the energy. I love coming here to Finland. Um, there are areas of the future that get missed in certain areas uh, yeah. of the world. Uh, and I like that we bring in a part of the future that it's not super developed here in Finland, but there's a, a lot of interest in Finland about. Yeah which is this whole area of biofabrication. Mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of all this, the brands that we work for, the current has been monitoring the space, um, the space of new materials. And biofabrication simply exploded in the past few years. Um, and you, Andres, was, you were there since the very beginning, years and years and years ago, a couple companies ago, one company ago. And can you give a sense to the, to the audience of your mission today and where was that mission from? Is that a continuation? Sure. So even the term biofabrication, that's a term that we use to describe our core technology at Modern Meadow, which is basically building materials or growing materials um, uh, using biology. Uh, biology in combination with material science and design. But this term of biofabrication actually has a longer history. It, it was initially applied to medical research. So biofabrication has a long history in medicine, um, you know, to grow things like tissues and organs for regenerative medicine. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the first company that I co-founded uh, in 2006 is a company called Organovo, which pioneered the 3D printing of human tissue that was used for uh, medical research to help big story. drug companies accelerate the development of new drugs by testing them on, on human tissues. And, and the idea for Modern Meadow sprang out of that. We thought if we can make uh, skin models that could be used by L'Oreal to test new cosmetics, why couldn't we grow you know, skin to make leather, right? And, and why couldn't we take this technology of biofabrication beyond medicine uh, into consumer applications? So that was the, the, really the provocation. And then fast forward many years, we realized you know, it, it's a good opportunity, but you have to change the technology to do it. The, your company for the past uh, couple of years have been Focus or to known by the fashion industry, being associated with the, with apparel. When people yeah. think of modern model, uh, modern model, they think of apparel today. Uh, why that focus on apparel, if that's a focus? Yeah, I mean, why uh, not beauty? Because when you say collagen, I think of beauty. I mean, collagen is one of the most important proteins um, in life, right? I mean, most the most important or the most abundant protein in your body is collagen. It's the main protein in your, in your skin and it's the, uh, the, the stuff that holds our cells together. So it's a very important structural protein. And what we do at Modern Meadow is we've developed a way of, um, of growing collagen and then assembling it uh, in different ways to create a whole range of materials that are inspired by leather. Because at the end of the day, the main biological building block of leather is collagen. So that's, 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 that's why we do that. But why apparel? I mean, um, you know, we, we think of, of leather as being an incredibly attractive opportunity if you're going to develop a next generation of materials. And the reason why is because leather is used everywhere. I mean, in this audience, raise your hands if you're wearing something made of leather or if you bought something made of leather in the last year, right? It's a huge market. You know, uh, traditional leather is a $100 billion raw material market, and it's $85 billion if you add in synthetic leather. So it's about a $200 billion raw material market. It's used everywhere, from furniture to automobiles to um, apparel, uh, footwear, you name it. Leather is used everywhere. But it's got a lot of inefficiencies. It comes from livestock, which is the biggest user of land, biggest uh, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, and a big user of uh, fresh water. And then on top of that, the, the production method to make leather goes through many, many steps and a lot of waste. A lot of material is wasted at every step of production. Um, and, uh, and, and, after, and if you think about it, despite how widespread this material is, and despite all the inefficiencies of it, um, you know, we still, I mean, let me, let me ask you, how many people in this audience can name a brand of leather material? Raise your hand if you can name a brand of leather material 
not product. So we see that as a missed opportunity. Oh, I know one. <laughs> okay, do you? Which one? Edelman. Edelman. That's, yeah, you're correct. But if you ask 100 people on the street, <laughs> name a brand of leather material, they won't they be able to it. name one. But hold on, I want to challenge you since you're talking about leather. First challenge. Yes. Um, on the sustainability front, there's a lot of excitement about Mother Matter and possibly being an alternative to leather in the future as you scale. Yes. But why do we need you? We have leather, you know, fake leather. Yes. So let, one important point here. We are not looking to imitate leather. Our, 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 uh, our, our materials, we call them ZOA, uh, biofabricated materials, or ZOA for short, are inspired by leather. So it's a whole world of materials that are made of collagen, which is the same building block as leather. They're inspired by leather, but they can do more things than just traditional leather. They, we can dial in the design properties, the performance properties. We can go beyond leather in many ways. And I think it's very important, if you're going to innovate, to not imitate, right? You can basically take what you like about traditional materials, but, but, but push the boundaries, do something new. And that's very much what we're looking to do I, in, in Modern Meadow. I'm a huge fan of that answer, but I'm going to put your touch on the fire here with one more Please. question. Please, go <laughs> so, ahead. So a good friend of yours, designer Stella McCartney, she is one of those champions on sustainability. She says, my leather pants are evil, right? Because it's the worst thing you can do to the environment is to wear a pair of leather pants, leather jacket. Um, and I was wearing leather in her talk when I met her. I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but she, she really means it. She gets, she gets her very angry. And in her product, she uses fall leather, which is petroleum. That makes me angry. Yeah. So, I mean, to your earlier point about there's uh, traditional leather that comes from animals, and then there's all kinds of you know, synthetic imitation products that are made from petrochemical products. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. And, and frankly, if you're looking at it strictly from an environmental standpoint, synthetic leather is actually better for the environment. And uh, you know, because it doesn't have the whole livestock footprint, right? Um, and that can be quantified using something like the Higgs index. So you don't need to take my word for it. There's actually standards out there that are used by the industry that evaluate all kinds of materials. So and Stella they, has a point. From a strictly <laughs> environmental standpoint, there are versions of uh, synthetic leather that are much better for the environment than traditional leather. That said, there are synthetic materials that are also really bad for the environment. So it all depends on what specific synthetic material you're talking about. Got it, got it. We have some images showing up um, of Mother Matto. And I want you to take us through, what is this production like? What is the fabrication like? What's the difference between production and fabrication? Sure. So how do we do it, right? I mean, um, what we do is we've developed a form of yeast, which you can see here. We've designed a type of yeast that you can brew to produce collagen, much like you would brew beer. And um, we then are able to grow it up in very large quantities in giant tanks. So imagine walking into a brewery, but instead of brewing beer, at massive scale, we're able to produce collagen. And then once we purify it, that becomes the building block of our materials. And depending on how we assemble the collagen, and then how we go through the tanning process, it can create a whole range of different material properties. So it's all under the, the ZOA label, but there's actually a pretty broad range of, 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 of products that can, that can be in that, in that category. And this, so that's this the is fermentation. In, this is the brewing. And this is in New Jersey or Brooklyn? This is, all, this is in New Jersey. So last year, we moved into the former headquarters of Hoffman La Roche in New Jersey. Um, and we were the first company to do that when Roche moved out. They bought Genentech in California. Mm -hmm. They decided to consolidate everything on the West Coast. And we were fortunate to be able to move into their wonderful facility. And so now we have 70,000 square feet to be able to accelerate our research, our development, and even our small-scale production there. And so this is our design team. So we have designers working side by side with material scientists mm -hmm. and biologists. And, uh, and then you created, um, the, there was a very important moment last year when you took ZOA, the material, and you developed a concept of a piece, like a, a T-shirt, yeah. uh, for and it became part of the museum collection. Correct. We did not expect to show something that year. But when the Museum of Modern, Mo Modern Art approaches you and says, we've got an exhibit on design, that's the first one that we're doing 
on, on, on fashion rather yeah, that we're doing modern. the first one in, yeah, in, in, in fashion amazing. that we're doing in 70 years i mean we haven't done one since the end of the second world war and we're doing a new one on fashion do you want to be a part of it your only answer if <laughs> only possible answer is yes like, fuck yeah. and you figure out <laughs> fuck yeah you figure out how to make it happen and that's what we did so we basically um, we 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 thought about what is it that we could do that could showcase um, ZOA in an unexpected way. And so what we decided to do is we decided to take a t-shirt because t-shirts are actually the blank canvas of fashion, right? And they're often associated with a revolutionary movement. You know, yeah. like if you have a revolution, you have to ask yourself, you know, what you what's the t-shirt? <laughs> what do you put on the t-shirt? And so we decided to take that t-shirt and to take an ordinary t-shirt, take it apart into pieces and reassemble it using a, a liquid version of ZOA where the, the, the liquid ZOA could serve as the seam to reassemble the different pieces of fabric. And therefore, we could show that ZOA is not only a new material, but could potentially be a new manufacturing technique as a way to join fabrics without stitching or gluing. That's, that's really cool. And then what, what's next then? Are you seeking partnerships in that space? for that to become commercial. A lot of the people, when they see your story and they, they hear about Mother Matto, that's the shirt right there. That's the shirt and MoMA. <laughs> it's right. really gorgeous and up it's close. Been, and it's been added to the permanent collection. Yeah, I know, I know. That's, so, congratulations yeah. on that. MoMA's our first paying customer. That, <laughs> for you, like you used to, because you're creating this every day, but we want to know when can we touch it? When can yeah. this be something that is consumer, it's, it's for the consumer and Correct. affordable? So, we are very focused on the consumer. Ultimately, the materials that we create have to really bring a benefit to the consumer uh, in terms of design, in terms of performance. It has to deliver something new. But our customers, our partners, our businesses, we are B2B. And, and, and we've identified and we're working with some of the world's best brands to develop our materials, to develop their products, and to um, integrate our technology into their production so that they can launch to their consumers. Now that takes time. Uh, it's not something where you just throw up a Kickstarter campaign and you're, you're, you're doing it next week. <laughs> and fashion is a little slow. Anything that has to do with Correct. open innovation And also tough. you want to make sure that you do it right with the right partners in the right way. Now we're fortunate to be working with excellent companies and it's a real, you know, we've got really deep strategic partnerships where there's a lot of sharing, there's a lot of learning going on. Um, and we look forward to showing up uh, with consumers within the next year or so. Like when? The exact date. Something. I'll, I'll, give me something. I'll just say this. We flew all the way here. You got to give me something. I'll say, I'll say this. <laughs> By this time next year, you will know some of the partners that we're working with. And do you have any of the big names, any of the new names? I know you have big names, but any of the new names or the usual suspects, champion of sustainability. Yeah, I, is it still a sustainable story? Yeah, I mean, I, I, the way we think about it is that we've, we have two different ways that we work with companies. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we're focused on developing broad platforms. We've got material platforms that can address a, a, a wide range of applications. But in bringing these platforms to market, we've identified a handful of partners that can help you know, with, by accelerating our learning and accelerate the development so that we can bring them to market. And, and that, that really deep partnership, we can only do with a few brands, right? You don't want to partner with 100 different companies because it, you're going to go crazy developing your platforms. But if you're developing a platform and, and, you, and you've partnered with a handful of them, that can really inform how you develop that platform, which then you can use for everybody. You can then sell that material or variations of that material to everybody. So there's companies that we work with as strategic partners, and then there's companies that we work with as just customers, right? And we have to basically think, when is someone a partner where we can do a real engagement? And then when is someone, someone we just want to be able to adapt the material and be able to send them samples so that they can prototype and ultimately launch products? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of what you have been doing up to now, it's that evangelizing, getting the word out, but now shit's going to get serious. This stuff's going to get very serious, <laughs> very quick. If it was completely, if it were completely up to you, how would it be the rollout of your material throughout industries? Is it really fashion first, like luxury fashion? Do you want mass market? Um, then do you move to beauty? Then you move to home? Like, what is the little ladder in your imagination, your founder mind? 
I, I would say that the way I've thought about it is that um, you, you want to work with companies where they can be a real partner to you in bringing this technology to the market and in, in explaining the story to the consumer. And there are companies that uh, are incredibly thoughtful about the materials that they use and the quality um, of, of, the, of their products. So that's why we've selected companies that, that are real innovators, that have had a history of innovating in materials and that have uh, a history of really being at the, at the forefront of quality. Um, if you can actually satisfy their needs, and they're, they're, it's a very high bar, but if it's good enough for them, then you can address a very, very broad market as well. But if you start really at the bottom of the market, you really only get one chance to make a first impression, and it becomes fairly difficult if you start at the low end of the market to then kind of walk your way up the innovation curve or the quality curve. So, for better or for worse, our choice has been to set the standard fairly high. That doesn't mean that we're waiting to be at the top of the mountain to show up, but we also don't want to be at the bottom of the mountain when we show up. We want to be somewhat up the journey. And in all honesty, what's your greatest challenge to get something like this out and from just conversation to actual realization? And I'd say that one of the big challenges is that, um, you know, in the last innovations in materials, when we're talking about atoms, you know, things that are made of you know, real substance, is difficult, right? Hardware is hard, as they say. Um, and material innovation, fundamental material innovation, I would say is even harder. I mean, that's the stuff that hardware is made of, right? And in the last century, there's been a, I mean, the 20th century was a, a revolution in new materials, right? It, 20th century brought us new polymers, synthetic fabrics, plastics. We wouldn't have, um, the information age, we wouldn't have, uh, you know, the digital economy if it wasn't for advances in materials, like semiconductors. Oh my God, one of my favorite ones is sugarcane rubber from Allbirds. Right. <laughs> but, 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 but these innovations in materials that came about in the 20th century, for the most part, were developed in very large companies, right? It, it took the companies like DuPont and Dow and BASF and 3M to develop new generations of materials. And they were able to spend hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars, and, and you know, decades to develop new materials. What's exciting now is that startups are able to do it as well. And they're able to do it in a fraction of the time and a fraction of the budget. And actually flip that, the most exciting materials in the space right now are startup created. The ones who are really capturing and gobbling up all the headlines around the world. Well, that, but the headlines, but at the same time, headlines is not always reality, as you know, Liz, right? Yeah, yeah and, the and bottom to your line. question, what's the biggest <laughs> challenge? The biggest challenge is that um, it's, it's, it's not as simple as moving electrons or you know, bits, right? When you're dealing with material science innovation, you not only have to develop it and it has to work and you have to get it right, but it has to scale. You have to be able to produce it at scale. It has to be able to work economically. And that industrialization is not something that moves from one day to the next. It's not something that moves at the same speed as um, you know, uh, digital media startups do. Hmm. So for the investing community to appreciate that to these are that. massive opportunities, these are huge markets with incredible potential to uh, create value and to have a positive impact in the world, but there's a different ramp up that is required. So you talk about the hockey stick talk that drives founders crazy it's, and compromise the quality it, of the vision. It's not, it's not about basically going from startup to unicorn in one year. Mm -hmm. You have to really go for singles and doubles and, and, and I'm be glad, patient. I'm glad you're saying that because this is, this is an interesting conference, right? There's a lot of founders in the audience. We have a sauna with investors. It's crazy here, right? <laughs> it's all about pitching. No conference is complete without a sauna, right? No, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> not after you come to Slush. And, but something that I see here, I see a frenzy on playing the investor's game instead of looking for the investor that would allow you to play your vision game and tell the others to fuck off, regardless how big right. they are. And you've been great at that. You really slow down to your own pace and you really perfected something that until the moment you felt comfortable to put it out. You, you cannot, when you're dealing with this level of innovation and scaling, you cannot 
play it as a, it, there's no such thing as a quick flip. It's right? not a lean startup there's, machine. There, I mean, you've <laughs> got to be lean. And we, I think as a company, you know, we're a, a six-year-old company that has developed 90 patents. We've partnered with some of the best brands in the world, with some of the biggest, you know, biochemical companies in the world. We've partnered with Avonik to scale our technology. Yep. There's a lot of real- But lean know, startup, like put it out there. If it doesn't work, well, we fix it. No, no, no right. it has you, to You work. can't move fast and break things work. because you're yeah. dealing with real production, massive scale, and if you get it wrong, the consequences are pretty dire in terms of just inefficiency and, 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 and cost, right? So what I would say is, is, is that in this space, it's better to kind of like measure twice and cut once <laughs> than to move fast, break things, scale too quickly, and realize you've built the wrong factory. And now you've got a fully scaled up factory that's not running the process that you need it to run, and you've spent hundreds of millions of dollars doing that. And there's companies that have done that in this space. We are fortunate to be you know, six years into this journey in a space where many companies have spent hundreds of millions of dollars to get here, We've only spent 50. And that might seem like a lot of money, $50 million. But, you know, DuPont, you know, and other companies like it had spent billions of dollars yes. developing new materials. So for us to be at the level of, of, of commercialization and scaling that we are, um, at this level of investment is actually remarkably resource efficient. So we are almost out of time. I wanted to tell everyone that if you have any questions about the space, about Andres, I want to talk more about biofabrication, we're moving to the founder's studio after this. But I want to leave something behind, like a message for, for, two, for quickly, like a quick takeaway. For consumers, why they should be excited about biofabrication. And for founders, they're chasing unicorns, all kinds of unicorns. It doesn't have to be hardware or bio. It could be software. What, what is your founder I would say that it? the reason why consumers should be excited is because we're living in a very exciting century. The 21st century, I believe, is a century where it's a biofabrication century. I really think that the next material age is a biofabricated age, you know, an age of biofabricated materials. Just as in the 20th century, we had uh, innovations in, in, in um, polymers and semiconductors, and you know, the, the Industrial Revolution would not have been possible without advances in steel. I think that we're on the cusp of something really remarkable happening when you take biology and the huge advances that have happened there and you combine it with material science and design. So the world of materials around you over the next few decades is going to transform. And it's exciting because it means you will have new choices as consumers for materials that are better, that bring some kind of new property, new design to your wardrobe and to your household and to your everyday. And it can also do that in a way that's better for the planet and that doesn't harm animals. What's one sentence advice for founders in the audience? Focus on long-term value, oh, right? Oh, that's deep. Create, create <laughs> a company that can create enduring value and you will do right. You will do right by yourself, by your employees, and by your investors. Thank you so much, Andres, for following my tip and coming here to Finland. We did slush, man, we did it, yay! Thank you, everyone, for being Thank with you. us. Thank you all. <laughs>